In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. You know it's six o'clock here in Rome, I mean in Italy, because the church bells are going off in the background, as you can hear. It's a nice sunny evening here. I'm in northern Italy in the Piedmont area, and I'm upstairs above the church where I reside. And uh, one of the beautiful things about Italy is that there is no complaint on the part of the citizens of the church bells ringing at all hours of the day. And this goes on all night. I mean, every hour the church bells will ring, and no one complains, which is a nice thing, provided they can sleep, which they can, of course, because they're used to it. They've been living in this situation, this uh, in this tradition, since, well, I think, four generations, five generations now. So let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, today, uh, the day after the solemnity of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, which I celebrated last night here with the church, we are always mindful of the power of Christ's resurrection and triumph over death, which right now we celebrate as a vigil mass. The Sunday vigil mass is always a celebration of Christ's triumph over death and power that casts out all evil and darkness. Now, for many of you listening, most likely in the uh, Americas, the English-speaking world there, it's the daytime. It's I think it's noon on the eastern coast, and on the western, it's around 9 a.m. And uh, central, I think it's uh, 11. And mountain, uh, what would that be? Um, 10? In any event, I thought today to address, in the context of the Sacred Heart, and in the context of the triumph of Christ, over death by the power of his resurrection. And on this day, Saturday, in honor of Our Lady, the Immaculate Heart, um, the virtue that is exemplified by the two hearts, that of Jesus, that of Mary, which is the virtue of humility. Now, they all encompassed all the virtues in perfect measure. Mary, from the moment of her immaculate conception, had all the virtues and in heroic degree by virtue of God's gift to her, of being conceived without any stain of sin. And this is a teaching of the fathers and of the doctors. And uh, it's something that uh, most of us really are not that aware of because we think that, okay, if Mary was immaculately conceived, she didn't really have to grow. She was kind of in a state of perfection all the time, but she did. And uh, this is uh, an important teaching that uh, I'm going to share with you in passing. And I mentioned this actually, in the Divine Will Prayer Book, and one of the footnotes, that is this teaching of the fathers of how Mary was always in the state of heroic degree, but yet had to continue to grow through sacrifice, through learning. She didn't know all things, you know, she didn't know where her son was for three days, and through obedience. And uh, so did Christ in his humanity. But one, ex one example <clears throat> shows me one virtue <clears throat> that they exemplified beautifully was the virtue of humility. Now, why do I wish to address this one particular virtue with respect to all others on this particular day between the feast of the Sacred Heart, the Immaculate Heart of Christ Sunday feast? Well, because recently, I had an experience here in Italy where, and it wasn't just one experience, it was actually three over the course of a few weeks, where it seemed to me that the Holy Spirit, through these events in life, 
was encouraging me to reflect and contemplate on these situations and extract therefrom the virtue that resolves all three. And that virtue is, in my discernment, humility. Now, let me explain to you the first situation that I came across. Here in Italy, the place where Luisa Picaretta was conceived, born, experienced tremendous mystical gifts, visions, and died, and where her cause was open and continuous. Her books were published and disseminated. Well, there's a following here among the Italians. There are quite a few Italians devoted to Luisa now. But Italy is very small as a nation compared to the United States or to like Australia or Brazil or other big countries like that, where De Luisa is also diffused. Uh, that is the writings and spirituality of Luisa. But among the Italians, and I'm Italian myself, so I'm not saying this in any way as a slight to them, because there are many beautiful Italians here that obey Christ's church, that is, the apostolic tradition passed on to the magisterium that puts out articulations that are consistent with the teachings of Christ and the apostles in the catechism, for example, in the Code of Canon Law, in magisterial documents through the Pope and through councils and through synods and so forth. So there, is, uh, there are many God-fearing Italians that obey Christ through the church as he desires, right? But in the last few weeks, I had an unusual situation where I was approached um, by some people who asked me to give some talks on the divine will here in Italian on Luisa. Now, I don't know who these people are, so I contacted them. And the response I got from one of three parties was one of um, aggressiveness. I don't know how, any other way to put it. This person that I spoke with informed me that she would like me to give some talks in Italian, um, all audio, and that this is what she told me. She knows all these priests that know Louisa. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. But what I do know is this. In our very second conversation, my, our first conversation was very short. She did most of the talking of who she was and what she does. In the second conversation, um, she criticized me because I didn't return her phone call when she called, right? So naturally, being a priest, I'm busy with confessions, mass, and, you know, giving communion, going to the sick, um, running errands. So she made two or three calls, and I, did, I didn't catch the first two, but I got the second, third, and I replied. And then I gave her a time by text when to call, so we connected. And the first two questions she asked me was, do I think Pope Francis is good or bad for the church? <laughs> and I started to laugh almost, because this has nothing to do with Louisa. And she contacted me for the reason of giving talks on Louisa. And then, of course, the next question followed is Francis a benefit or a good or what was the question? Positive or negative for the church? So I finally understood by the Holy Spirit's inspiration that this individual was trying to test me to see if I qualified for her talk. <laughs> now, let me remind you, I don't need to give talks to anyone. I'm qualified by the magisterium to teach theology. I don't need to prove my qualifications to anybody. But her point was this. She was not, and I could tell just from her tone, she was not in favor of Pope Francis, and she wanted to see if I would defend him. So my, I caught on and I said, listen, I want to be very clear. Those people who openly badmouth the Pope, tell people not to follow him, I want nothing to do with. Let me be very clear to you, is what I said to her. And her response was very aggressive. Oh, I'm surprised a priest would talk like that. I said, yes, a priest that is loyal to the magisterium and the Roman pontiff should talk like that. The problem is there are individuals out there donning a cleric, clerical collar that openly create confusion in the church by instead of 
qualifying the Pope's statements, telling that people to read what he says and to understand the context, assume that he's a bad Pope and tell people not to follow him. And this harms the Lord deeply. It wounds his sacred heart. It wounds the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Now, why do I say this? Because Jesus tells this to Louisa. The very people that seek to promote Louisa, not some, all of them, just a few bad apples out there. Now, I'm not saying they're bad irreversibly. I pray for these people that they may come to realize that we should not attack those in positions of authority. What does Our Lady say in her own messages? Pray for your shepherds. She doesn't say, dismiss them, get rid of them, don't follow them. She says just the opposite. It's your duty, not your option, to pray for them, to offer sacrifice if you need to, and not to criticize them. So they're not irreversibly bad, but they, they are misinformed and they have a critical spirit. This is not conducive to living in the divine will. Okay? Now Jesus, when he was addressed by two types of people, he employed two different types of reactions in the scriptures. He was approached by the Pharisees and he reacted very strongly. He exercised tough love to them. Why? Because they were critical. They didn't want to accept his new gospel. And then there were others that were in sin, but that he was very tender to, like the adulteress. Now, why these two different attitudes of our Lord toward two different people? Tough love toward the Pharisees and scribes, tender love toward the prostitute, the tax collectors, and the sinners. This is the answer. The scribes and the Pharisees were filled with their own ego. They had no humility. They didn't want anyone to change their comfortable lifestyle. So Christ, seeing that they were hard of heart, gave them tough love to shake them out of their indifference. They had to be spiritually shaken. So spiritual shaking is legitimate, and it is sound Catholic moral theology. There's nothing wrong with using tough love. The problem with today's woke culture is you can't use the rod and spoil the child. You have to let the child be spoiled without the rod. And that's wrong. That's anti-biblical. Now, the rod is not physical beating this. No, it's spiritual shaking. The rod is a symbolic meaning in that part of the scripture. And that's what Christ did with the Pharisees and scribes. The tender love he exercised was toward those who were in sin, yes, but were humble. You say, well, how can you be in sin and humble? They were victims and also in need of liberation from their own addictions, from their condition in life, but they were open to change, to welcome something that would help them out of their poor plight. The Pharisees and scribes were not open to this help. They were, even though they were sinners. See, there's a difference between a sinner and a slave of sin. Christ makes this distinction in scripture. A sinner is someone who sins and acknowledges that they sin so they confess when they can. A slave of sin is someone who doesn't care to confess and sins all the time. And that's why Jesus said, woe to those who are slaves of sin. He never said woe to sinners. Never said woe to sinners. And St. John says, he who says I am not a sinner is a liar. Okay? So... I'm using this example of this one experience of this individual in Italy, southern Italy, because it highlights the importance of humility in the divine will. You see, we can live in the divine will, or I should say this, we can try to live in the divine will and have the best intentions of doing so. But if we are not properly disposed, we're going to fall again and again. And again, remember, when working for God, one has to rely on the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, to live in the divine will. The Holy Spirit is the person of the Trinity that gives us docility and humility. It comes from the Holy Spirit. Because if at any time, whosoever will start to rely on their own strength, even though their performance shows zeal, 
it will not be long before they fall. If you read the writings of Louisa, the hours of the passion, what does Jesus say about Peter taking out his sword? I won't say it's his sword. We just say a sword, where it came from, we don't know, to cut off Malichus's ear. Could have been a sword he got from the centurion. But the point is, Jesus said in the hours of the passion to Louisa, excessive zeal wounds my heart because it's not regulated by humility. So when working for God, one has to, it's not an option. Every day invoke the Holy Spirit at the beginning of every day. And rely on the Holy Spirit throughout the day, because if at any time one starts to rely on his own strength, even though they have zeal for working for the church and defending the truth and the doctrine and tradition, they, it won't be long before they fall because of lack of humility. Okay, now the other two examples were people that sent me emails criticizing Louisa's writings, completely overlooking the glaring fact and being completely oblivious to the same fact that the writings are approved by the church. You have the hours of the passion that have multiple imprimaturs in the heel of stats. You have the Blessed Virgin Mary in the kingdom of the divine will that have multiple imprimaturs in the heel of stats. You have the first 19 volumes that have the imprimatur in the heel of stats. I mean, these people ignore these glaring facts. Why? Uh, this is why. And this is the reason why some people don't grow in the divine will because they lack humility. They choose to stick to their own beliefs rather than what the church teaches. And in fact, this person that invited me to give talks in Southern Italy, from what I came to learn later understand, has the same disposition. And of course, I'm not mentioning names because people are always deserving respect. No matter what they do or what they say, they're always bearers of the image and likeness of Christ. And we have to always respect that no matter what religion, what race, what provenance, they always, because of the image and likeness of God that they bear, deserving of our respect. And we must always have hope in them, no matter what, like Jesus did in Judas to the very end. To the very last moment of Jesus' conversation with Judas, Jesus was imploring him as a beggar for his conversion. So we should never cut people off in the sense that we give up on them. We should sometimes cut them off from communication, yes. Sometimes that's tough love and that's necessary so that they grow out of their apathy, learn from their mistakes. We shouldn't always be pampering people all the time. This is how the little flower of France put it. Some people are so thick skinned that we must take them by the scruff of their collar to teach them. Others, we must take by the tip of their wings because they are so gentle. When they make mistakes, we have to correct them humbly, gently. Others, forcefully. So you see, each situation require, elicits a different response. Look at Christ at the marketplace. His white anger, he was angry. Make no mistake about it, there's nothing wrong with being angry if it's in the right context and right time and place. And then we see him giving the parable of the prodigal son, the son who goes to live a life of sin and dissipation with prostitutes, and he comes back and the father who represents God the Father throws his arm about him, slaughters the fatted calf, puts sandals on his feet, rings on his fingers, throws a celebration because he was acknowledging of his sinfulness, willing to be forgiven, and willing to make a change in life. Christ sees these things, you see. So let us talk about the humility of Louisa. Louisa Picaretta, Jesus, often would lead her by example, and the example was that of humility. And he tells Louisa, the uniqueness of each nature 
when, well, let me, before I go into the divine will theology, let me talk about the virtue of humility. I have a few quotes in front of me right here. So let me start with June 30th, 1901 from volume four. Jesus tells Louisa, the virtue which most exalts God is humility. Let me repeat that. The virtue which most exalts God is humility. And the virtue which most exalts the creature before God and men is humility. It's the same. So humility exalts God and exalts us before God. April 3rd, 1899, volume two. Jesus again reminds Louisa, there cannot be true humility without trust, which is another word for confidence in God. Humility without trust is a false virtue. Now, what does trust mean or confidence mean in God? It means when you pray for something, you must believe in it, that God will answer you. Doesn't mean you will always get what you answer, but it means that you trust that God will always answer you the way that is best. And like Mother Teresa of Calcutta, you should thank God for answering you before he does. That was, this was saying to Mother Teresa of Calcutta's approach in life. If you read her uh, official autobiography, there's only one. I think I read it about oh, 20 years ago. I think it was by a Kaplan Spink from, because she lived with Mother Teresa for many years. And uh, she did so with the permission of Mother Teresa in order to write her biography after Mother Teresa died. And Mother Teresa told her, don't write it until I die. Yes, her name is Kaplan Spink. Kaplan with a Y, a K and a Y in Spink. She's from England. And uh, that's the best and the number one official autobiography in it. By many beautiful things about seeing Mother Teresa of Calcutta, including giving her, giving her fiat to God. When I met Mother Teresa on two occasions, I spoke about the divine will. Now, back then, there were only cassettes. There were no CDs. There was no iPad. There was none of this, you know, these cell phones. This was around 1990, I'll say two, 92, the first time I met Mother Teresa of Calcutta. So I, I gave her some audio cassettes on Louisa Pickerett and Divine Will. But Mother Teresa told me, we don't have an audio cassette recorder. So then I went on to explain to her about Louisa Picaretta. And she never heard of Louisa before. So I spoke a little bit about it. And um, I met her again a few years later. And uh, then she spoke to me more at length, length the second time. But the point is, in the, the biography, you'll find that Mother Teresa gives her fiat to God every day. And she invokes the divine will. And you also find that in life, she made it her habit to pray to God and Mary for an intention. And right after the prayer, she would offer up a novena of thanksgiving, even before Mary and Jesus answered her prayer. And people would ask her, Mother, that's kind of a false trust or confidence in God and Mary, because you don't know if they're answering you or not. And she would reply, no, it's not. It's proof that my trust is unshakable in God and Mary, because no matter what their answer is, I know they were going to answer me the best way they can. Not the best way they can, but the best way that is for me. You see, that is trust. So when Jesus tells Louisa, there cannot be true humility without trust, without confidence. This is what he means. And it's not just trust in prayer. It's trust in God's providence. It's trust in God's mercy. It's trust in God's love and never going to allow you to be abandoned in his, in his um, actual grace that comes to it every moment of life, in his efficacious grace that comes in certain interventions during life in his sacramental grace that always meets you in the sacrament, you can rely on that with trust, it never will fail you. Even if the priest is not holy, he will always come to you in the sacrament. Remember, the sacraments don't depend upon the holiness of the priest. They're given up and above and beyond his holiness. So you don't have to worry about, oh, is this priest holy? Is it going to be a valid sacrament? It's always a valid sacrament. 
provided the priest intends to confer the sacrament validly. Okay? And other things in life. This humility, this humility depends upon his trusting God. Another passage, June 20th, 1900, Volume 3. Jesus reveals to Louisa, the most perfect, the most sublime humility is that of losing one's way of reasoning and of not discoursing on the why and the how, but of abandoning oneself to God in one's own nothingness. And in so doing, the soul, without realizing it, finds itself immersed in God. Now, what does this mean? It means that the soul must abandon its own belief system. I don't mean belief taught by the church. I mean its own ideas, its own personal philosophy, its own trappings and clingings in life. Like those two people that criticized Louisa's writings without even giving it a, a, a moment's reflection on the fact that many of them are approved by the church. This is a lack of humility. They don't even look to the church for guidance. They look to themselves. And this is one of the dangers of people going to these unapproved, self-acclaimed promoters of Louisa on blogs. They will mislead you, and they always do eventually. They get things right, yes, but it's always mixed with falsehood, and this is the danger. There are many blogs out there, and I won't ever get tired of saying it, because as a pastor, I must remind you and update you on the current state of affairs in the church, not yesterday, but today. And these bloggers are availing themselves of the naivete of many of the listeners without any theological credentials or authorizations to teach. So I've alerted you. There, I've done my job. And that's a lack of humility. If some of these bloggers had these virtues cultivated well, they would consult with theologians that are authorized by the church. You know, there's a document by the Vatican on the vocation of the theologian. It's essential in the church. The church needs theologians in which to formulate doctrine, produce encyclicals, produce motu proprios, produce apostolic exhortations and letters. Theologians are always engaged in preparing the drafts and the final versions. I know this for a fact because I've been involved. So they would do this if the virtue of humility was present. Okay. Now, Jesus goes on to tell Louisa that when, we, when a soul abandons oneself to God in its own nothingness, without realizing it itself, it finds itself immersed in God. Now, what is this nothingness? Abandoning oneself in one's own nothingness. This is what it means. And this is what Louisa would do daily. Entering into a recollected state, even momentarily, where you empty your mind, literally. You try to stop thinking. This is a very solitary approach to spiritual Catholic prayer. You empty your mind. It's called kenosis in Greek. And you allow, by emptying your mind, God to fill it with sound Christian doctrine, principles, teachings that are enunciated by the church. So once you empty your mind of your own reasoning, just put like a, what they call it, tavola rasa. I guess that's a clean slate in English, right? Tabula rasa, clean slate. You completely clean your mind. If you can't do that, you have a way to go spiritually. If you can't empty your mind within a few seconds, it certainly takes a little bit, takes it maybe a minute or so. If you still can't do it, that means you need to pray more. You need to contemplate more because it means your mind is almost addicted to certain patterns of thought you can't break yourself from. And unfortunately, some people that condemn the Pope without even considering it the context of his words or consulting with experts that know what the Pope intended to say, but formulate their own positions and outright condemn him, 
Those are the people who are addicted to these, to these patterns of thoughts in their minds constructed by their own belief system. So here's the litmus test for those of you who want to know if you are in, able to enter into your own nothingness so as to immerse yourself in God. Try this test every day. Recollect yourself. Empty your mind of everything. Don't be afraid. Oh, the devil's going to take control of it. No, it won't happen. You are baptized. You are sealed with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You're confirmed with the Holy Spirit. You don't have to be afraid of that. Empty your mind because the intention of emptying it is not just so anything can enter. It's only so that God can enter. And God sees your intention. He gave you a guardian angel to guide you. So don't worry about being intoxicated once you do this by evil spirits. Empty your mind and then ask the Holy Spirit to breathe in your breath. Don't even think. Just breathe in your breath. The same motion that acted in Adam before he thought is to operate in you. And once you start to breathe calmly, then you invite after the Holy Spirit, which is the first motion of God in man, you invite the Father to beat in your heart. That's the second motion of God in an atom in man. And what happens once the heart beat? It puts into motion the blood circulation, which is the third motion of God in man, which is the sun. So the spirit breathes in your breath, the father beats in your heart, the sun flows through your life blood. Then you begin to think. This is the same process that happened in the first man created in God's image and likeness. And this we should mimic. We should copy, we should emulate every time we enter into our own nothingness. And then once we think, we start to recall, that's the memory, the Holy Spirit again. The teachings that we were taught by the Catholic Church, by the Christian Church. And this disposes us to engage the active intellect. So the recollection is the passive intellect. The memory is, sorry, the passive intellect, which is recollection. And the active intellect is what we call the mind or the just plain out, straight out intellect. So you have two components of the intellect, passive and active. So the, the three powers of the soul are the memory, passive intellect, the intellect, which is the active intellect, and the will, which puts into physical motion that which is fed by both, the passive and the active intellect. So we're drawing from the treasure trove of 2,000 years of Christian theology, philosophy, morality, um, discipline, articulated in the church's catechism and canon laws. We don't know it all, all, not all of us, but what we know is sufficient. And then we invite, invite the divine will with that in mind. We invite the divine will because the divine will does not contradict what we're taught by the church. It doesn't contradict scripture, which the church articulates in its catechism. It doesn't contradict the councils of the church, which are articulated also in magisterial documents as well as in the catechism. And this is how we enter into our own nothingness. So let me, in that context, reread this passage of June 20th, 1900. So as to help you know whether or not you're entering, entering, entering your own nothingness. So as to allow the Holy Spirit, then the Father, then the Son, to operate in your body and then operate in your soul. Through the breath, the heartbeat, the lifeblood, the memory, the intellect, the will. Okay. Jesus says, the most perfect, the most sublime humility is that of losing one's own way of reasoning, that's one's own belief system, and of not discoursing on the why and the how, meaning don't use your own thoughts, but let the church, let God guide them, but of abandoning oneself to God in one's own nothingness. And in so doing, the soul, without realizing it, finds itself immersed in God. This in turn produces in the soul the most intimate union, the most perfect love toward its highest good, which is God. This is the soul's greatest advantage, for in losing its own reason, the soul acquires divine reason. 
and in losing every inquiry of itself, whether the things that happens to it are favorable or adverse, it will be interested in and will acquire a language that is completely divine and heavenly. Additionally, humility produces for the soul, Jesus adds, a garment of safety. Now, what does this mean? Before finishing the sentence, this is important. Humility not only brings us immediately as an automatic result of entering into our nothingness to perfect union with God, but it also produces a safety, a garment of safety. What does this mean? It keeps us from going off the deep end and following false doctrines, bloggers that are telling you this mystic's true, this mystic's true, and in the end, they all turn out to be false. We're seeing this happening every four, three, four months. I mean, some people still follow these bloggers because they're attached to their own reasoning, okay? So the garment of safety means entering into your nothingness and allowing the church, God through the church to guide you, even in your own personal inspiration. You're not deviating from the church teaching. You are automatically by itself immersing yourself in God, which produces the most intimate union and perfect love to the highest good. And this is the soul's greatest advantage because you acquire a divine reason and a garment of safety, meaning God will guarantee that you will not go off the deep end of true, sound Christian doctrine. God will guarantee it just by using this approach of entering into your nothingness. So Jesus adds, additionally, humility produces for the soul a garment of safety, whereby wrapped in this garment of safety, the soul remains in the most profound calm, thoroughly embellishing itself in order to be pleasing to its dearest and beloved Jesus. So this is another advantage of humility. You know, we have to be trustful of God that he will answer our prayers, he will provide for us, he will always be there for us in the sacraments, and that humility with trust enables us to enter into nothingness, our own nothingness. And why, why, why does Jesus say nothingness? It's because we came from nothing, literally. And when we acknowledge our origins, we're exercising humility. Humility isn't a false, pious, oh, let me fold my hands together and tilt my head 45 degrees with my eyes facing the clouds and stand like that so everyone in the church can consider me pious. That's not pious, that's piotious. I don't know where that came from, but it sounds right to me. <laughs> but humility is not putting on airs or impressing other people. It's being true to yourself, meaning acknowledging that you are who you are, dust, and to dust you will return. That's a fact. You can't get around that. So entering into your nothingness is acknowledging yourself as nothing. And this is why Louisa, at the beginning of her, fusing herself in God's will, would say, I am nothing, God is all, come divine will. She wasn't just saying this because she thought it was nice or piety, <clears throat> piotious, but she really believed it. And so should we, because it's the truth. It's grounded in the truth because we come from the ground. And we will enter back into the ground only on the last day of the general judgment to be assumed like Mary from the ground into the clouds with Christ and the twinkling of an eye. June 3rd, 1900, Jesus adds, volume three, lack of esteem for others is a lack of true Christian humility. Let me repeat that. Lack of esteem for others is a lack of true Christian humility. Remember what I said earlier, this person who was trying to test me to see if I would side with this individual and criticize the Pope, which I didn't do. I said this person was using the wrong approach. And I acknowledged it and stopped it in its tracks. I said, I'm going to tell you right away, I am not, I want nothing to do with these people who openly badmouth the Pope without in seeking, inquiring into what the Pope meant, reading what he said in quotes. Don't just listen to bloggers that condemn him and journalists that misinterpret his words. I said at the same time, 
these people are not bad irreversibly. There's always hope for them. Like Jesus with Judas is carried till his last conversation with him. And this is true humility. Lack of esteem, Jesus said, for others is a lack of true Christian humility. We must esteem everyone, no matter who they are, even sinners. Jesus says, because humble and docile spirit knows how to respect everyone and always interprets the things of others in a positive light. That's beautiful, isn't it? It gives us the perfect occasion to overlook the faults of others without judging them. It's the perfect passage in Louisa's text, the best passage in all of her writings that gives us reason to dismiss the faults of others like Jesus did when he was being nailed to the cross and said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Right here, June 3rd, 1900, Volume 3. I'll repeat the whole thing to you in full. Lack of esteem for others is a lack of true Christian humility and docility because a humble and docile spirit knows how to respect everyone and always interprets things of others in a positive light. Always interprets the things of others in a positive light. It's not easy and it's not supposed to be. That's why we're here to be tested. Another passage of humility from Louise's writings comes from September 14th, 1921, volume 13. My daughter, Jesus reveals, sanctity in my will grows in every instant. In nothing in my will, and nothing in my will escapes its growth. Neither can the soul interrupt its flow in the infinite sea of my will. The most indifferent things, such as sleep, eating, work, and all else, can enter into my will and take their place of honor as agents of the operation of my will. If the soul desires my will, all things from the greatest to the least that it performs, that happen to it, become occasions for it to enter into my will. And this does not happen to the virtues. So he adds, therefore, despite all the good the will the soul may have in exercising the virtues, the virtues remain idle if the soul sleeps. The same applies to patience, humility, and all other virtues. Since they are virtues of this lowly world, other creatures are required for their exercise. Meaning, if we don't encounter an impatient situation through an impatient person, we don't grow in patience. But he says, on the other hand, my will is the virtue of heaven. And I alone suffice to keep the soul in every instant, in continuous exercise. It is easy for me to keep the soul elevated on high night and day to sustain the continuous exercise of its will in my will. Now, Jesus is saying that he sustains the growth of our virtues in his divine will by his own operation in us, even when we sleep. But remember what he said earlier, he cannot do this in the soul unless it cooperates in the days of its waking hours with his virtues by respecting everyone, esteeming everyone, seeing the actions of others always in a positive light. But remember, that doesn't mean exercising tender love all the time to all people, pampering everyone, like this woke culture tells us to do. Give everybody an A-plus in school. Don't fail anybody. Don't test anybody. Just give them a pass. This is bad. Spoil the child. Sorry, that expression of scripture comes to mind again. Spare the rod, spoil the child. And the rod is a symbolic meaning for spiritual shaking, which Christ used with the Pharisees and scribes many times, not once. Eight times, Christ issued woes to the Pharisees, calling them whitewashed tombs filled with dead man's bones and other remarks of this, of this nature. So respecting, esteeming everyone includes tough love. You're doing this out of love for them. Sometimes you have to shake them into 
you know, their sobriety, spiritual sobriety. So, in saying this, I pray for people like this that I meet, that uh, might see need to grow in this area. Why? Because I do too. I may not need to grow in the area they do, but I need to grow in other areas, and we all do every day of our lives. We will never stop needing to grow until we stop breathing. That's a fact. And God made it this way. We can be perfect in this life, but a perfection that consistently depends upon the Holy Spirit. Remember what I said at the beginning. Never fail to rely upon the Holy Spirit. When working for God, one has to rely always on the Holy Spirit. How do we do that? Unceasing prayer. We must always rely on the Holy Spirit. Because if at any time one should start to rely on his or her own strength, even though his or her performance shows zeal for the church and God, it won't be long before they fall, because they lack humility, which is an unceasing prayer. I want to pause here and also remind you, which I haven't done in the last few segments because of my transition to Italy here in my new assignment, to continue to support the source of these talks, which is Radio Maria. You know, they depend upon your monetary and spiritual support because they are 100% listener supported and commercial free broadcast system. Okay. Radio Maria, I thank them because they are, they have allowed this broadcast to go throughout, you know, the network to many areas, many listeners. And we should in Thanksgiving support them in the way we can. Right. So on that note, I mentioned the virtue of humility requires um, humility. I'm sorry, trust, and it exalts God the most, it exalts man the most before God. Without trust, humility lacks that which renders it meritorious. Right? And humility provides the soul with a garment of profound calm, safety, and inspires it to respect the good in others. Okay? So humility is a beautiful virtue that we can always grow in. And... Uh, we never stop growing in it. One last example I wish to give on humility it goes back again to St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta. She, one day when she was picking up these abandoned dying souls in the streets of Calcutta, was approached by a Muslim, and she respected all religions, and she has this in her constitution, by the way. We will never deny anyone, regardless of their religion, a burial, a death, everything they need, including the sacraments. She loved all souls, and she treated them all as equals, because God loves them all as his children, regardless, regardless of their faith. So why shouldn't we? So one day, while she was picking up an abandoned child, this person walked up to her, screamed at her, saying, you're stealing these children, and spit on her face. And without blinking an eye, she said, that is for me. Now, what are you going to give to Jesus? And he, overwhelmed by her humility, walked away with his head low in shame. This is how St. Paul says we conquer arrogance, with love. Overcome evil with love. Overcome pride with humility. Overcome incredulity with faith. Overcome hopelessness with hope. Overcome hatred with, with care, with love as well. This is similar to the canticle of St. Francis, right? So in these last few moments, let me talk to you just a little bit, deviate a little bit from the theme of humility about the Sacred Heart, the feast we just celebrated yesterday, which is a beautiful feast. You know, it goes all the way back to the, to the apparitions of Jesus to St. Margaret Mary Alacom. Because Jesus, I don't know if you um, recall these apparitions to St. Margaret Mary in France, gave her 12 promises. And subsequently, inspired also by these apparitions, Pope Leo XIII put out an encyclical, Anum Sacrum, Holy Year, 
which was addressed to all the patriarchs, primates, archbishops, bishops of the Catholic world in communion with the apostolic see. And which he talks about the importance of this devotion to the sacred heart, in which he says that Christ snatched us from the power of darkness, quoting Colossians 1.13. And all men individually and collectively have become to him a purchased people by the shedding of the blood of his heart. Okay. And then he adds here, I want to share this one passage of him with you. Um, Since there is in the sacred heart a symbol and a sensible image of the infinite love of Jesus Christ, which moves us to love one another, it is therefore fitting and proper that we should consecrate ourselves to his most sacred heart, an act which is nothing else than an offering and a binding of oneself to Jesus Christ, seeing that whatever honor, veneration, and love is given to this divine heart is really given to Jesus Christ himself. For this reason, we urge and exhort all who know and love this divine heart willingly to undertake this act of piety, of consecrating themselves to his sacred heart. So this is what Jesus asked Louisa to do, to consecrate herself to his sacred heart every day as a source of protection, a refuge, and not just to his heart, but to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And Louisa would do this daily. And the two hearts beat as one. So Aristotle once said, true love is two souls dwelling in one body. And that's exactly what happened between Jesus and Mary. If you read the hours of the Passion, Mary's soul bilocated Jesus and accompanied him wherever he went. Every pain he experienced, she experienced by virtue of this love of the two hearts beating in one body. So if we consecrate ourselves to Christ, we're necessarily consecrating ourselves to Mary and vice versa. But there are two separate consecrations that the church gives us, and they assume various forms. There's not one we have to do, but there are several out there, and it's up to you to choose which one in length and quality appeals to you the best. And of the 12 promises of the Sacred Heart, the 12, I really am impressed by the most because it offers us really um, uh, the guarantee of eternal salvation. So I'm going to quote to you, if I can pull it up real quick, this 12th promise of the Sacred Heart of Christ um, yeah, from St. Margaret Mary Alcott. Hmm. We just celebrate. I gave this homily here, I found it. I gave this homily uh, last uh, Sunday. And the 12 promises are as follows One, to those devoted to my sacred heart, I will give all the graces and help necessary for their state of life. Two, I will establish and safeguard peace in their families. Three, I will console them in their afflictions. Four, I will be their sure refuge. So my brothers and sisters, you do not have to go look for a safe physical haven. The only refuge is the sacred and immaculate heart. I said this a thousand times and I won't get used to saying it. You won't find anywhere in any approved literature by the church that there is any other refuge than the sacred and immaculate heart. I will be their sure refuge in life and above all at the hour of death. Number five, I will pour abundant blessings on all of their labors and undertakings. Number six, sinners will find in my heart an inexhaustible source of mercy. Seven, lukewarm souls will become fervent and with the practice of this devotion. Now, what is this devotion? Going to confession and communion, the first consecutive first Fridays of the month. Now, confession doesn't mean it has to be on that day. It has to be within 20 days, provided you're in the state of grace. But you have to receive communion on that day. Number eight, fervent souls will ascend rapidly to a higher perfection. Nine, my blessing will remain in those places 
in which the image of the Sacred Heart will be displayed and venerated. So God's blessing will be in these places. Now, can these places be desecrated? Absolutely. How? With mortal sin. And then they have to be reconsecrated. This is why it's a healthy practice for priests to be asked by you, the laity, to come every year to re-bless their homes, re-consecrate their homes. Same thing with churches. If a mortal sin happens in a church, like a murder, like in St. Patrick's Cathedral, when Cardinal O'Connor was there, on the occasion of a man on drugs going in naked into the church, picking up the yambo and hitting the lectern over the head and killing him on the stage, eliciting the police to come in and shoot this man and kill him right on the stage during the mass, the church would have to be reconsecrated. It was desecrated. Same with a home. If a grave sin happens in the home, it has to be reconsecrated. So Christ's blessing in this ninth promise will remain in those places in which the image of his sacred heart is displayed and venerated. But if something grave happens there, it should be reconsecrated or blessed by a priest again so that that blessing will remain. Number 10, to all those who labor for the salvation of souls, I will give the grace to be able to convert the hardest hearts. Number 11, Persons who spread this devotion will have their names written forever in my heart. Sounds familiar? The book of the Blessed Mother for the month of May. Mary writes in the introduction, You have been given this book by me, and I have inscribed with indelible characters of gold your name within my heart. Here, Jesus says to Margaret Mary Alacoque, the 11th promise, Persons who spread this devotion will have their names written forever in my heart. So if you have this devotion to the Sacred Heart of the first consecutive nine Fridays of the month, and you read the Blessed Virgin Mary book for the month of May, your name is inscribed on both their hearts. Isn't that good? And number 12, the 12th promise, to all people who will receive Holy Communion on the first Friday of nine consecutive months, I will give the grace of endless perseverance and of eternal salvation, guaranteed eternal salvation. Only two things in the Catholic Church guarantee eternal salvation. That is two sacramentals, the nine First Friday devotion to the Sacred Heart and the brown scapula. Those who die wearing the scapula will not suffer eternal salvation, eternal damnation, okay? So with that, I conclude. May God bless you and keep you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.